Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. Venezuela has been the scene of intense street protests in recent weeks as the standoff between opposition protesters and President Nicolas Maduro's government has paralyzed the country. Now, Maduro's unpopularity and Venezuela's collapsed economy has led to much speculation that the military may take power in a coup. But one thing that may be protecting Maduro is the fact that a number of senior government officials have been implicated by the U.S. in cocaine trafficking. These include not just security officials and current and former generals in the military, but also his vice president, Tarek al Assemi, as well as his interior and justice minister, Nestor Reveral. That gives some of the most senior officials an incentive to hang by Maduro. If the president goes, some of them might be put on trial in the U.S. or elsewhere. Indeed, while Venezuela may be best known as an oil exporter, over the past decade it has also become a major transit hub for cocaine from neighboring Colombia. By one estimate, as much as 40% of the world's cocaine passes through the country. So on this edition of Global Journalist, we're going to take a look at Venezuela's drug trade. In a few minutes, we're going to bring in a panel of experts to take us deep into this issue. But first, we're going to talk to Deborah Bonello in Mexico City. She's a senior investigative researcher for Insight Crime, a website that investigates and analyzes organized crime in Latin America. Deborah, welcome. Hi, Jason. Well, uh, tell us, if you would, uh, just a little bit of background about how Venezuela became such an important cocaine trafficking point. You know, 20, 30 years ago, you didn't hear about Venezuela being involved in this type of activity so much. No, well, I mean, you have to remember that geographically, Venezuela neighbors one of the biggest coca producing countries in, in the world. Um, and Colombia, Peru and Bolivia tend to kind of uh, compete for, for the biggest production figures, but Colombia at the moment um, is the biggest producer. Um, and obviously their shared border is very porous and and cocaine, uh, coca leaf and, and cocaine has long moved between that border. Um, but our investigation has focused very much on the arrival of Chavez in Venezuela and how that did coincide with an increase in drug tra tra trafficking activity in the country, which we uh, put down to a lot of different factors, obviously. Um, the military had already been implicated in drug trafficking cases before 1999, when Chavez uh, took the throne, so to speak. Um, but but we, we have charted sort of a shift from the military as a facilitator to a, to a more of an active participant in the drug trade. Now, what I mean by that is before Chavez took power, what you would see would be, you know, um, military, fairly low level military officials most of the time taking payment to turn a blind eye to cocaine shipments through the country, to turn a blind eye to things coming over the border, maybe occasionally to take payment to guard shipments for Colombian organizations. Um, now, as, you, as, you, as Chavez took, took hold and as mm, much more high-level corruption and tolerance of corruption took hold within the regime, you've seen the role of the military increase enormously. And now we have uh, information about um, the military buying or exchanging uh, directly with the FARC, you know, weapons for drugs or buying uh, cocaine directly off the FARC or, or supply, suppliers through the FARC. Um, well, sorry, so, so you're saying that what's happened then is that the Venezuelan military is essentially, in some cases, trading arms with the Colombian rebel group, the FARC, for cocaine, uh, and then trafficking it, exporting it afterwards. Yeah, it often happens. I mean, I think the military, we, from what we understand, the military is not deeply involved in transnational cocaine trafficking. Um, but as you know, and as you mentioned, you know, a lot of senior officials have been either sanctioned or indicted. For example, Nestor Everol, who is currently the Interior and Justice Minister, was before the director of the um, sort of the, the anti-drug agency that was set up by the Chavez administration soon after they chucked, they, they kicked the DEA out in 2005. And the indictment um, says that Reverol and his deputy um, took payments from drug traffickers to alert them to when anti-drug crackdowns were going to be staged by other parts of the government um, and to basically sort of 
help them move drugs through the country. Um, now, from, from, from our point of view, a lot of this connects to a radicalization that happened within the Chavez regime after the 2002 coup that we saw that displaced him for a couple of days. And after that event... And I'm sorry, Deborah, we lost your audio there for a moment. But uh, if you could pick up on that point about Hugo Chavez, uh, as well as this network known as the Cartel of the Sons, which I understand has its roots in the Venezuelan military. Tell us about this group and how it got started. Yeah, the Cartel of the Sons we've traced back to the mid-90s, and it started in the National Guard. Uh, the term is a little misleading, cartel, because it it, it kind of insinuates a, a sort of, you know, organized uh, operating entity. And really, it's a term that's used to refer to a lot of disparate um, networks within the military. And now... Um, the, the Venezuelan government, civilian government itself, um, and and their their involvement in in drug trafficking, um, and we 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 think that um, since Chavez took power in Venezuela, this involvement within the military has spread to different parts. So, like I said, it began in the National Guard, but now we believe that all four branches of the Military, the Venezuelan military are involved in some shape or form in uh, in drug trafficking. Uh, so it has definitely expanded in terms of the the different branches of the armed forces involved. And well, tell us just a little bit about Venezuela's president Nicolas Maduro. What has he said about these cases? His vice president has been sanctioned by the U.S. Treasury Department. Uh, various other officials, as you mentioned, are under indictment uh, in the U.S. I mean, as you as you can see, the, the the government of Nicolas Maduro has dug in, and the most important thing to them is staying in power. And what the administration has done as these sanctions and indictments um, have come down from the United States, the most recent of one was, of course, against the vice president, Tarek al Asaimi, for his involvement in drug trafficking when he was governor of the state of Aragua, which has a coast, a northern coast, um, is he he brings them closer to him. He embraces them even more and defends them against, you know, the U.S., the evil empire who are trying you know, to invade and bring down his government. Um, so in a way, it feeds into his imperialist rhetoric, but also it allows him to protect uh, these people who are, you know, wanted for very serious offences. And it becomes in everybody's interest for the administration to continue. Because if the government falls, then a lot of these people who are um, wanted for these sorts of offences become exposed to prosecution. Um, so everyone just want to keep wants to keep the uh, socialist in, in inverted commas party going for as long as they possibly can. Well, Deborah Bonello, thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome. A reminder that you're listening to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. We're talking today about the drug trade in Venezuela, a country that has become a key hub for cocaine trafficking. The U.S. has accused a number of senior officials in Venezuela's government of involvement in the trade, including the vice president and the interior and justice minister. Now, to learn more, we're going to bring in three other people who have been following this closely. Joining us from Tacoma Park, Maryland, is Douglas Farah. He's a foreign correspondent, a former foreign correspondent for the Washington Post. He's now a senior visiting fellow at the National Defense University and the president of IBI, a national security consulting firm. Also joining us from Alexandria, Virginia, is Ralph Espak. He's the director of Latin America Strategic Affairs at the Center for Naval Analyses, CNA, a think tank. And in Washington, D.C. is Noel Moore. He's a professor of international affairs and international business at George Washington University. Welcome to all of you. Uh, and Douglas Farrell, let me start with you. Just get us up to speed on the news. President Maduro uh, is facing these enormous protests uh, right now in Venezuela. As many, of you, many people have been watching these on the news. This has generated uh, you know, some violence between Maduro supporters and the opposition. The president has said he's going to rewrite the Constitution as well. Just get us up to speed on the latest. <laughs> 
Well, the rewriting of the Constitution by Nicolás Maduro is a major step because his predecessor, Hugo Chávez, wrote the existing Constitution in which he essentially uh, stacked the deck against the opposition in multiple ways and made it very, very difficult for them to have any real power. In the last elections, they, uh, despite all the odds, they actually took the opposition to control of the, of the National Assembly of the Congress. And so this is an attempt to further disenfranchise the opposition, make it even more difficult, and concentrate power in the hands of the president, who already has an enormous amount of power and has already shut down uh, almost all the independent media, has nationalized illegally many of the uh, companies operating there, has put his political opponents in prison, etc. So this is really an act of desperation to overthrow the the constitution or try to overthrow the constitution that his very popular predecessor Hugo Chavez instilled and of whom he is an acolyte. So I think this is a, one last move to try to consolidate power in ways that uh, he, he still doesn't have, but he's on the very cusp of very authoritarian, uh, totalitarianism. And no more at George Washington, if I could turn to you. Venezuela is uh, does have one of the largest oil reserves of any country in the world, but the economic situation there has been quite dire. Just give us a, a, a little bit of background as to why that is. Well, the main, the main issue in the short run has been the collapse in oil prices. But Venezuela has done far worse than other oil-dependent countries in the neighborhood. So neither Trinidad nor Ecuador have seen anything like the economic crisis in Venezuela. The essential problem in Venezuela has been that the government has controlled access to foreign exchange, that is the dollars that Venezuela earns from exporting oil. It essentially collects those dollars and then transfers them to people who are politically favored at a very low price, a huge way of benefiting some select groups. But this creates all sorts of massive distortions and makes it impossible for ordinary people to buy imported goods. And unfortunately, Venezuela is dependent on imports for things like food and medicine. And so you've got these rolling shortages throughout the country. And the situation is now so bad that the government is terrified that if it relaxed those exchange controls and just let the peso fall, excuse me, let the Bolivar fall to, uh, to its, its market level, that it would ignite a wave of massive unrest as well as anger a lot of people within the government for whom Maduro depends on for support. So right now there's no easy way out. And Ralph Esbeck at the Center for Naval Analyses. The U.S., if I could just move this to uh, what Deborah Bonello had been talking about with regard to the U.S. efforts to place sanctions or indictments on senior members of the Venezuelan government for their alleged involvement in drug trafficking. How, has, how effective has this been in sort of pressuring the Venezuelan government? Has the U.S. seen the outcomes that it had hoped for from these? Uh, I think it's fair to say the United States in recent years has not seen the outcomes it expected to see or wanted to see out of these sanctions. The sanctions and indictments, is, the indictments are a different thing, but they're a legal matter. But the sanctions as a political matter um, are often driven by uh, domestic congressional interests wanting to do something in Venezuela and not really knowing how. In this case, I'd agree with Deborah that, uh, that the sanctions at this point are likely to be, you know, have no impact or could be counterproductive because you're looking for fissures or divisions between the within the socialist uh, regime, and you want uh, some military people and some people with some clout in, in the PSUV and around Maduro to see a future for themselves after elections or after some sort of transition that transpires. And the more uh, the pressure is put on these individuals and the more they don't see a future beyond a U.S. prison, uh, potentially, then uh, it just entrenches the regime further, and it makes and it complicates uh, those personal calculations that uh, the international community wants to see um, evolve into a, uh, a push for um, transition. And Doug Farah, last fall in New York, there were two nephews of Venezuela's first lady uh, who were convicted of conspiracy to transport cocaine in the U.S. What what did we learn from that case about the uh, involvement of drug cartels, drug trafficking in the government? Well, I think it shows just how pervasive it has become and, and how necessary for the survival of the regime it has come has become and how it, far it extends past this, the military and the security services that control the territory where the drug trafficking can, uh, comes through and where the FARC on, in Colombia has been very active in supplying uh, the, the military there. I use the term in some of my writings, the criminalized state, which I think Venezuela fits the bill. In, in, it means that it's, it's a state that's not just corrupt, it's a state where 
the government itself and the upper levels of the government reach out to transnational organized crime as an instrument of policy and as an instrument of revenue. And I think you see that in, in Venezuela and as you see the different levels of corruption that go from uh, the very tops of the, of the actual administration and then inevitably filters out to the family members who have privileges, as Ralph was talking about, or uh, they were talking about earlier, the dollarization gives people privileges. This gives them the ability to generate dollars. And so I think if you look down into the family members of many, many people high up in the regime, it go, they, they tend to install their relatives in key positions. They tend to uh, bring in the family every way possible so they can milk the system as much as possible for as long as possible. And no more. Some of our listeners may be more familiar with the problem of Mexican cartels. How, how do these groups operating in Venezuela, how do they compare with some of the larger drug trafficking rings based in Mexico? Like, who, who's the boss? Who's, who's controlling no, this trade? Yeah, there's no comparison. What you've got in Mexico is you've got these lar relatively large-scale organizations that are involved in trafficking narcotics either from Colombia through Mexico or from, Cent from Colombia through Central America and Mexico into the United States or from Mexican areas of production into the United States. They're private. They pay off public officials, they bribe and subvert the state, but they are not generally made up of government officials and certainly not high-level government officials. What you've got in Venezuela is massive drug trafficking occurring at two levels, exactly like Mr. F like Doug Farah said. The first is at the level of the state, high-level state officials facilitating a movement of narcotics from Colombia through Venezuela and on to mostly Honduras. And then you've got a lot of low-level dealers uh, involved in what's called narco menudeo, just basically street level sales inside of Venezuela that got started after Plan Colombia started to divert cocaine from going directly to the United States through Venezuela. A lot of those guys were paid in kind. So sorry, uh, you said you referred to Plan Colombia, Colombia, and this was the U.S. effort to uh, root out uh, the production of cocaine in Colombia. Exactly. The U.S. gave a lot of aid to the Colombian government, also shut down a lot of trafficking routes through the Caribbean. So drugs started to travel through Venezuela and then into Central America. And because a lot of the individuals who were originally involved in the trafficking, both low-level entrepreneurs as well as these high-level officials were getting paid in product, not in cash, they started to sell that product in Venezuela. And that has a lot to do with the huge explosion in crime and violence that's been happening inside Venezuela, which is usually not what you'd expect to see in a country that's been sliding towards dictatorship. A reminder that you're listening to Global Journalist. We're talking today about drug trafficking in Venezuela, where a number of senior government and military officials have been implicated in the cocaine trade. We're joined now by Douglas Farah, a former Washington Post correspondent, now a visiting fellow at the National Defense University in Washington by Ralph Espach of the think tank, the Center for Naval Analyses, and by Noel Moore, a professor of international relations and business at George Washington University. If you're interested in more Global Journalist, you can visit our website, globaljournalist.org. There you'll find our ongoing reports on undercover international news and human rights issues. You can also like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or subscribe to the program on YouTube or iTunes. And Ralph Esbeck, if I could move this back to you then, one of the things that I was wondering if you could tell us just a little bit about is if uh, President Maduro does leave power or is forced to step aside, what happens to some of these people who are generals in the military or his vice president or in the cabinet who are involved in this trade? What, what becomes of them? Depends on uh, on how that transition occurs. I think if the uh, there are several different scenarios. Uh, one of which, the first of which, is that the chaos we see in the protests and the and the widespread opposition evolves into general violence and even potentially uh, some level of civil war because there the uh, the communes, the the, the the Chavista supporters um, in some areas are very well armed and this could this could become a violent situation and then. Um, that would uh, obviously demand a more urgent international solution. Um, but if uh, Maduro is, is, if there's a negotiated solution, either through some sort of a coup or some sort of a group of, we don't need to call it a coup, we could call it a, a, a group of uh, people within the regime that allow Maduro to fall sick and he, is able, he has to go to Cuba for medical treatment or something like that could be negotiated, uh, then the treatment of those people 
and their ability to maintain their position in the government and, and their and their future uh, lives could be an important part of that negotiation. So I think a lot is in play, and uh, the United States could play a role in some of this. I think, as I said before, the United States right now is, is really leaning on regional partners to, to sort of lead the negotiation effort. Um, but it has it has some influence in terms of the sanctions and the ability to allow um, allow those sanctions to slide or, or retract them if it could be part of a useful international solution um, that would lead to elections um, in Venezuela. And Doug Farah, we heard no more speaking earlier about Plan Colombia, the U.S. Colombian effort to uh, sort of. Uh, get rid of cocaine trafficking in parts of Colombia. Um, how has that affected Venezuela? How have events there in Colombia shaped what's happening on the ground in Venezuela and these border regions now, particularly the peace agreement between the FARC uh, Colombian rebels and the government? Well, I think it's had a tremendous effect because what you see starting from the very beginning of his government, uh, but especially from 2005 forward, is Chavez's very warm embrace of the FARC, which were the largest uh, cocaine producing uh, group in the world, and allowing them access to the presidential palace in, in Venezuela and a very tight relationship between his security forces, etc. And that brought a whole new wave of trafficking because it was no longer, as other speakers have said, the little um, dribs and drabs of drug flowing through. There were a few corrupt officials that became official Gov uh, policy of the Chavez government to allow the FARC to traffic its cocaine through there. And that just spread enormously. And si simultaneously, sim uh, Plan Colombia was uh, uh, relatively successful militarily and had pushed the FARC from the center of the country to the border regions. And so they consolidated themselves along the Venezuelan border where they had a safe haven and where they could get medical attention, where they could buy supplies, where weapons could flow in. And they, they were pushed out of the center, so they became much more concentrated and much more dependent themselves on illicit activities, not just uh, cocaine, but also the trafficking of gold, coal tan, other minerals, etc. So I think all of that uh, has pushed the drug problem into Venezuela in ways that were maybe a decade ago unimaginable, but became a really necessary safe haven for the FARC. And no more... Talk to us just a little bit about some of the drug trafficking routes that lead out of Venezuela. Uh, it, I understand that a few years ago there were something like 30 suitcases full of cocaine that was discovered uh, at, at the airport in Paris on a commercial flight from uh, Caracas to Paris. I understand there was also uh, a B-727, a, a large jumbo jet that was found uh, sort of in the desert in Mali that had been burned up that was thought to have originated uh, with drug traffickers in Venezuela. So how is this cocaine flowing out to Europe, uh, to elsewhere in the world from Venezuela? Well, like, like Doug Farah said, it's, 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 it's useful to think or to realize that Originally, the drugs that were moving or started to move through Venezuela in the 1990s were moved out on small boats into the Caribbean or to Central America for land transit to the United States. Today, most of it takes place in the form of unidentified flights that overfly Venezuelan airspace, take off from the border regions on the Venezuelan side near the Colombian border, go out into the Caribbean, and then generally land in Central America, mostly in Honduras. And that is, as far as we know, the way most of the product moving towards the United States gets through Venezuela. But the Venezuelans are pretty entrepreneurial, and there are a lot of corrupt officials in Venezuela looking for any way to tap into this revenue stream that they can, and they've been getting more and more and more creative with essentially using their control of Venezuela's international airport to try, or Caracas's main international airport, to try and smuggle massive amounts to West Africa or to Europe directly, literally in commercial flights. But most of it is illegal, or I should say unidentified aircraft flying over Venezuelan airspace. In 2014, the Venezuelan government made a big show out of shooting down some of these aircraft. And uh, after a few incidents where they shot down some Mexican aircraft that may or may not have actually been involved in the drug trade, they backed off on this. Even then, it's pretty clear that that was just for show. That was just a big way for the Venezuelan government to say, hey, look, no, we're not complicit. If we were complicit, we wouldn't be shooting down airplanes. That's crazy. How could we possibly be complicit? 
And Ralph Espec, I wanted to ask you as well about uh, Venezuela's relations with its neighbors. Venezuela, of course, has tried to form sort of this new leftist bloc, an anti-U.S., anti-imperialist uh, group of nations in Latin America with countries like uh, Nicaragua, Bolivia, Ecuador. How, how do its allies, how do other countries in the region view this issue? Well, one of the uh, one of the interesting elements of the Venezuelan crisis that it has laid bare the stark divisions and deepening divisions and divide across the region, um, especially between leftist governments uh, that take a, that use an anti-imperialistic narrative and anti-U.S. message, um, and and are redressing long-term grievances on the part of much of the poor population of the country. Those those governments, as you mentioned, that are members of, let's say, the Bolivarian Alliance, and the rest of the region, uh, which are taking a more a more centrist left position. Um, and then there are countries like Brazil and, and Argentina that are divided um, within themselves in their domestic politics, like, uh, like I'd say the United States is. So the region is very divided in this, and that has undermined its ability to respond to this crisis. So um, UNASUR, which is a, a regional grouping that was led by Brazil and Argentina and many of the countries uh, with Venezuela under Chavez has failed uh, miserably to, to respond to this crisis and delayed, uh, delayed talks and kind of helped the Maduro regime for a while. But also the Organization of Amer American States has tried very, very with a lot of effort to, um, to try to rally a, a, an international response and has thus far has not been able to uh, bridge that divide and get enough support to, to really impose pressure on the government. And so uh, this really shows the region is, um, is in a bad way and it's hard to see how it's going to patch together afterwards. And it's going to complicate the international response, uh, the hu enormous humanitarian assistance and economic assistance Venezuela is going to need under any scenario. And Douglas Farah, our time does grow short, but I wanted to ask you, where do you see this going uh, over the next two to three years? Obviously, Venezuela faces a political crisis, it faces an economic crisis, and then there's also this enormous sort of criminality, organized crime problem. Well, as Ralph just said, I think the scenario, any of the scenarios, is going to be massively difficult to reconstitute a civil society that functions in a moderately democratic way and that gets to some of the roots of the corruption. I mean, you, you have multiple thousands of Cuban intelligence agents in the country running most of the intelligence community, as well as a lot of their economy, et cetera, to root out all the external influences and come back with the government it's not contaminated by drug trafficking is going to be enormously difficult whether there's a soft landing and Maduro is simply allowed to move to Nicaragua or Cuba where he wants to go or if he hangs on and it turns into a, a much bloodier conflict uh, any scenario means a huge loss and huge investments necessary in aid coming in the next few years which can be very very difficult to muster that's going to have to do it for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Missouri School of Journalism and KBIA Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Our thanks again to Deborah Bonello, Douglas Farah, Ralph Especk, and Noel Moore. Our assistant producers this week are Trevor Hook and Lauren Wartman, with supervising producer Rachel Foster Gimble. Alyssa Blyle is our visual editor with assistance from Hannah Sandfeld. Pat Eker is our audio engineer, and Travis McMillan is director. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in.